Even if you're not a Boy Scout, watch this video because it is the best beginner's guide to coin collecting that you are gonna find. We're gonna learn about all these different bills and much, much more. Silver Picker here and welcome to the Silver Picker Squad. Now, today's video is essentially going to be a beginner's guide to coin collecting. I have been getting more questions than I've ever gotten before during this quarantine period about how to start collecting coins. And I am going to give you all the basics that you need to know in this video. And what's better, I'm going to do it in the context of a guide to the coin collecting merit badge for the Boy Scouts of America. Now, many of you guys didn't know this, but I am actually a former Boy Scout and I did indeed achieve the rank of Eagle Scout, the highest rank in scouting. So a big shout out to all my Boy Scouts out there, all my Eagle Scouts out there, and all my Girl Scouts out there too. And if you are not yet a Boy Scout or Girl Scout, but are of the age to do so, I highly encourage you guys to check it out because it is so rewarding. I learned so much and it absolutely made me a better person. So I highly recommend it. But if you're not into scouting or if you're an adult or if you don't care about Boy Scouts or Girl Scouts at all, I still encourage you to watch this video because it will teach you everything you need to know to get started in coin collecting and start appreciating the hobby of kings. So, let's start with a list of requirements. As with every Boy Scout merit badge, there are a list of requirements, and in this case, for the coin collecting merit badge, there are 10 different things that we're gonna learn about today. Each of them have some subcomponents, but we're gonna learn about 10 basic aspects of coin collecting, everything from the history of how coins were made, all the way up until how you can get started today with your very own collection. So, if you wanna check out the full list of requirements, you can check it out on my website at thesilverpicker.com. Humanity has been producing coins for literally thousands of years, so as you can imagine, the process has changed quite a bit from way back when till today. Well, way back when, when coins were first starting to be produced, they were cast, which means we took a mold and poured molten metal into it so that it would harden and eventually you could crack it out of the mold and you would have a coin. Well, after that, as time progressed, they had hammered coins, where they would take a die designed for a coin, set it into an anvil, place a coin blank or a planchet onto it, and then literally hammer it so that the design in the die would appear on the coin blank. Well, that was a manual process and it would take one person to make one coin at a time. Well, later on in the 1500s, screw presses were developed, and that was essentially a press that could press multiple coins with the use of a bunch of people turning this heavy press. But it wasn't until the Industrial Revolution when steam-powered presses allowed one person to operate a coin machine that could press many, many coins at once. And then, of course, that eventually got towards mechanical presses and eventually to the computerized high-tech presses that we have today. Now, the way that the United States Mint and many other modern mints around the world produce coins is essentially this. They take coin blanks or planchets, heat them up in a furnace so that they're soft and malleable, then they're washed and dried to remove any impurities, then they're sent to a machine that basically squeezes them to produce the raised rim, which protects the coins when they're in circulation, and then they're finally pressed in the dies that create the obverse and reverse designs, as well as a reeded edge if necessary. Then the coins are inspected for quality, packed into bags, and shipped off to the Federal Reserve where they can later be distributed to local banks. And where are the active U.S. mints? Philadelphia, San Francisco, Denver, and West Point. Bada bing bada boom, we're done with the first requirement. Obverse, reverse, reading, clad, typeset, date set. For whatever reason, those are the terms that the Boy Scouts of America handbook wants you guys as new coin collectors to know. I think there are tons of other important terms, but in terms of the requirements, obverse. That is coin collector lingo for the heads or the face of a coin. Reverse. It is coin collector lingo for the back or the tails of a coin. Reading. Those are the little ridges along the edge of the coin that you might think are there for grip. Well, that's not the reason. The reason that they're there is actually because back in the day when coins were made out of gold and silver, people would shave little bits off the coin and over time collect a big pile of gold and silver and thereby really stealing from the people that they passed those coins later off onto. So they created those ridges or reeds around the coin to prevent people from scraping it away because if somebody scraped it away now, you would notice. Clad. 
Back in the day in the United States, coins were made out of 90% silver. But when silver got too expensive to put into coins, they had to make a change. So what they did is they took a solid copper core, which was a less expensive metal, and then clad it or clothed it in a silver colored metal, which was a nickel copper alloy. And that's where you get clad coins. Typeset. Typeset is basically a style of collection in which you try and collect one example of every single type of coin within a given set. But the best part is, is you get to define that set. You can define it narrowly and say, I want to collect a typeset of all the different types of cents produced by the United States. Or you could do it broadly and say, I want to collect one of every type of coin produced by the United States. The possibilities are endless and you get to set the rules. And that's why I like it. That's my favorite style of collecting. A date set, in contrast, is where you take one type of coin and try and collect every single date and every single mint mark of that individual type of coin. So that could be, for instance, one of every single date of every single Lincoln cent produced from 1908 all the way to the present. Coin grading helps collectors determine the condition of a coin. The Sheldon grading scale, which is the widely accepted grading scale that starts at one or poor and ends at 70 or mint state, near perfection, helps us all speak the same language. Because as you know, if you go on eBay and see a coin that's described as being in good condition, that shady seller and your definition of good may be very different. Uncirculated. This describes a coin that looks as though it just left the mint. It should still have all of its original luster and no evidence of wear, even on the highest points of the coin's design. Extremely fine. All design elements still show, but high points are now worn flat. There's little to no luster that remains. Very fine. Moderate wear with some loss of detail evident in the design. Very good. Most central detail is now worn flat, with some inner lettering still visible. The rims remain full. Good. Rims are mostly full, but may be flat or slightly worn into peripheral lettering in spots. Poor. This coin is really pretty ragged and only can be identified by its type, date, and mint mark. Now, proof coins are not a grade. Proof doesn't describe the condition. In fact, it actually describes the manufacturing process that's used to make them. They are made on specially polished dyes specifically for collectors and are not intended for circulation at all. Encapsulated coins are coins that are hermetically sealed into plastic holders to protect them from the elements. Graded coins are encapsulated coins that also have been given a condition grade like the ones we just described by a third party grading service such as PCGS, NGC, or Annex. When it comes to storing and preserving your collection, there are two critical things to remember. Number one, resist the urge to clean your coins. Do not clean your coins whatsoever. It destroys the value, and yes, coin collectors can tell if you've cleaned them. The second thing is do not store your coins in PVC containers. Now, if you want to learn more about that, you can check out my video right in this card over here that goes more into depth on that. But essentially, PVC leaches out chemicals and will destroy your coins over time. So always buy your coin collecting supplies from a reputable dealer. Now, there are lots of different ways to store and protect your coins, but three of the most common methods are using Mylar flips, two by two cardboard coin holders, and albums. The best things about Mylar flips is that they have a crystal clear viewing window, they can hold a coin of any size up to about two inches in diameter, and they protect coins from scratches, and of course they're pretty cheap. However, what I don't like about them is that whenever you put a coin that's smaller than the maximum two inch size, they shift around all the time, and I hate that. So I almost never use these. What I much prefer for my loose coins are two by two cardboard holders because they have a beautiful crystal clear window right in the center to look at. They have plenty of room on the cardboard to write notes like where the coin's from, what year it was minted, or what the metal composition is. And you can put them in a really organized fashion in boxes or even in display albums. They are also really, really cheap. The only negative is that you have to buy a lot of different sizes because the window in the center of the 2x2 is specifically sized for individual coins. Also, because they're closed with staples, they could theoretically damage the coin later down the road. Another common way to store coins is, of course, in albums. And I love albums because they make it so easy to store them in an organized, compact way, and most important, display them and enjoy them. The only downside is that they're relatively expensive.
There are lots of different books and resources out there about coin collecting, but the number one of them all for US coin collectors is the Red Book. It's like the coin collector's Bible. Now, as you see, this one here is from 2011. I personally do not collect modern coins, so for me, this one is perfectly fine. And guess what? I got this one for a dollar at a used bookstore. Now, the way to use it is really simple. It's a directory, and it starts with the lowest denomination and goes all the way up to the highest denomination. So you pick the denomination that you're looking for, say, half dollars, and then, depending on the type of half dollar, it's then arranged chronologically. So let's say you're looking for a Benjamin Franklin half dollar, you would know that you need to go past all of the different early half dollars, go past the cap bust, go past the Liberty Seated, go past all the different things until you arrive at the Benjamin Franklin half dollar. Then once you're there, you can go and pick out the specific year and mint mark and see all sorts of information like the mintage and some of the values. Now, a word of warning, don't pay attention to any of the values printed in any of these books. They do not matter. The only values that matter are what people are actually paying for the coins. So eBay sold listings, auction listings, and of course dealer gray sheets. Similarly, for world coins, I love using the Krauss Publications Guide to World Coins. And in this case, it's organized in the same exact manner as the US Red Book, but instead of starting with the denomination and then going to the specific type and then going to the specific year and mint mark, you start, of course, with the country. So you start with the country and then continue that process till you find the specific coin that you are looking for. Now, there have been tons and tons of books written on practically every single type of coin ever produced in the entire world. So if you're if you're interested in specializing in something, I highly recommend you get a specialized guidebook. Now, this book in particular was sent to me by one of my fans, one of you guys. Alistair Jones wrote this book because he didn't see a good guidebook on decimal half pennies from the UK. And he's actually got a whole series that's coming out. I haven't started reading it yet, but I cannot wait. So I'll put a link down there below also if you want to get a copy of this. Support the community, right? Now, part two of this requirement is to read a numismatic magazine or newspaper. Now, I think that these requirements were written a long time ago, and I'd like to say that I think that this should be updated to include YouTubers and bloggers like myself. So ask your counselor, do videos from my channel count? Or take a look at my blog on thesilverpicker.com. Maybe some of the articles on there counts as well. If not, you've got a stickler of a counselor, check out a magazine like The Numismatist or coinage or something like that and take a look at the articles inside. They're really interesting in a lot of cases and then describe that to your counselor. The State Quarter Program is arguably the best thing the United States Mint has ever done for the hobby of numismatics. For 10 years from 1999 to 2008, Five quarters each year honoring the 50 states in the United States was minted. They're not worth that much in circulated condition, but they're really fun to collect and have fantastic designs. The America the Beautiful quarters are similar. They have 25 designs celebrating either a national park or a significant national site. This series runs from 2010 to 2021. So like it says in the instructions, I challenge you guys to start your collection like that. Go to the bank, go to the grocery store, get some quarters and look through them and try and see if you can put together a full set of state quarters or America the Beautiful quarters. Believe it or not, it's not that hard to do and it's really, really satisfying and fun. This one's really easy. You probably have all those coins lying around your house somewhere. You know, that dusty bowl by the front door? Yeah, that one. And if not, you can fill out what you don't have from the supermarket or from the bank. Really, really easy. Now, here's an example of where you can find the mint mark and the designer's initials on a coin. However, I'm not gonna show you all the rest of them and bore you with it, you can find those on your own. But an important thing to note, not every coin has a mint mark or designer initials. So don't drive yourself crazy looking for something that might not even be there. Okay, this one's pretty silly because it actually has the name of the figure printed on the bill below the portrait. Come on, that one's too easy. So if we're gonna go through it, let's at least go through it with some cool banknotes from my collection. On the $1 bill is George Washington. On the two is Thomas Jefferson. On the five is Abraham Lincoln. On the six, ha, gotcha there, there's no six. On the 10 is Alexander Hamilton. On the 20 is Andrew Jackson. On the 50 is Ulysses S. Grant. On the 100 is Benjamin Franklin. 
And for those of you that are really interested to know, there's actually a 500, 1,000, 5,000, 10,000, and even a $100,000 bill printed by the US. Those are no longer in use. But if you guys think you know who's depicted on those bills, put it in the comments below. Let's see who can get it first. What's legal tender, you ask? Well, it's just basically a fancy way of saying any coin or bill minted or printed by a government that is accepted as a valid form of payment legally for all debts, public and private. The Federal Reserve System is complex, but for our purposes, it's simply a body that determines how much money should be produced in the country at a given time. And then it takes those bills and coins and distributes them via its 37 banks and branches to all the commercial banks that ordinary citizens like you and me and businesses use on an everyday basis. Requirement number nine. Do one of the following. Collect and identify 50 foreign coins from at least 10 different countries. Collect and identify 20 banknotes from at least five different countries. Collect and identify 15 different tokens or medals. Or for each year since the year of your birth, collect a date set of a single type of coin. Well, you're on your own for this one, but I'll give you a tip to start. Use your voice. Let everyone in your network know that you're collecting coins and banknotes. You'll be surprised how many people will say, yeah, I've got a few coins left over from my trip to Costa Rica. Or yeah, my dad used to live in Switzerland. I think I've got some old francs. Or if you can't do that, check your local coin store and rummage through their junk bin. It's really an inexpensive way to get a lot of very cool stuff. Or of course, you can buy a grab bag from eBay if you dare. Requirement number 10, do one of the following. Tour a US Mint facility, tour a Bureau of Engraving and Printing facility, tour a federal bank, visit a numismatic museum or exhibit, attend a coin show or coin club meeting, view the website of a US Mint or coin dealer, give a talk about coin collecting to a group such as your troop, a Cub Scout pack, or your class at school, or do drawings of five colonial era US coins. Now that is definitely a lot of options, so I'm sure you'll be able to find one that fits your needs. Now, to be honest, I think that visiting a website is kind of a lame way out of this one, and I highly recommend you try one of the more challenging ones, but given the current situation, if that's all that's available, then you should do that. But what the rest of them have in common is it really is telling you guys just engage with the community. Whether it's going to the Mint and going on a tour with other interested people, or going to your local coin club meeting, or any of the other things, it's really about engagement and helping grow the hobby, learn for yourself, and share also with others. And I highly recommend all of you guys take that into account when you choose this last part of the merit badge. So that about does it. You guys should all be ready to get your coin collecting merit badge. If you're not in the Boy Scouts, I hope that you enjoyed this anyway because I had so much fun making it. I love engaging with new people in the community and helping new collectors really get to enjoy the hobby. There are some bad apples out there that will try and rip you off and give you bad information and I hope that for you newbies out there, it doesn't turn you off from the hobby because it has so, so much to offer. I love it. Most of the people watching it love it, and I'm sure that you'll love it too if you decide to start joining us in, as they say, the hobby of kings. If you like this video and you want to support more content like this, I would love it if you'd consider supporting me on my Patreon page. The links are below. There's lots of other great stuff to learn from this channel, so if you're not yet a subscriber, I'd love it if you would join and subscribe here and watch the rest of my videos, because there's a lot of cool stuff coming down the pike. So I hope you enjoyed it. Stay tuned, and until next time, Silver Picker out. A huge, huge thank you to each and every one of my wonderful patrons. You guys truly are making this channel possible. And I've got to say, it has been an absolute pleasure getting to know each and every one of you in the Discord chat. I also want to make special mention of Darcy Shopka, my first platinum patron. Your generosity is truly, truly appreciated. Thank you all so much.